In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No other way. You've heard 100,000 messages on that. There's two ways the world is described in the Bible, good and bad. God has made the world, and Jesus tells us to go out into the world and preach the kingdom of heaven. But yet Jesus told Pilate, he said, this is not, my, my kingdom is not of this world, if it was, my servants would fight. And that the world is enmity with God. And it can be confusing. And when the church starts to try to change the meaning of the word of God to fit social norms, to, to be part of social justice or political correctness, it gets even more confusing. And we start getting farther and farther away from it. We have a world of creation and we have a world of deception. I don't know if y'all know it, I'm sure you do, but the very first sin was based on deception. That's why they use the word Satan for the serpent, because Satan is, is described as, or is the description of deceitfulness. That's why Satan entered Judas when he went to go find a way to deceive Jesus with the, with the hierarchy. The light of Christ is the truth of God's Word. Jesus said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yes, I know somebody else wrote it, but nothing's written unless Jesus says. Amen. That's the way I believe the Word of God is. Amen. I don't care who put pen to paper. This is the Holy Spirit speaking. But these writers, like my preaching, God allows mistakes. You know, there's times in here where Paul says, this is not a commandment of God, but I've been given permission to say this. But Jesus also said, the Holy Spirit only speaks what God says. And I only do what God has me to do. I only do the will of God. Um, the world will tell you that you won't die. The world says it's not a problem. And everyone but the person listening to it is deceived by it. As long as you're a Christian, you believe the Word of God, you won't be deceived. But isn't it funny, how many of y'all have ever known somebody that's on drugs or alcohol, and they have a, a great business and they lose the business? Have y'all ever seen anybody like that? Or they lose their family, and then they lose their life? And they say that the, one of the things, one of the characteristics about drug use is that it deceives you, and they use that word, it deceives you into believing that you can quit any time. And you ask people, like the boy I talked about last time that broke my heart, seeing that, that young man on the verge of death, and I knew it was because of drug use. You could ask them, and they say, yeah, well, I can quit any time, but just don't want to. No, you're being deceived. And we're being spiritually deceived by the world, and unfortunately, people within the church are starting to try to deceive us mm -hmm. and tell us that we're not going to die. Today's church teaches about the comfort of the love of God, but they don't talk about the discomfort that sometimes comes from the love of God. I remember I was at a Zoom meeting and they were talking about the love of God. And I said, yeah, but we don't talk enough about the cruelty that's involved with the love of God. And they were like, what? What are you talking about? God's love isn't cruel. I said, God's love sent Christ to the cross. God's love told him no three times. It told Paul no three times. God's love uh, for us demands justice and a good will. And that's why people often get in trouble. But that's okay when you believe God is there with you. And you're able to praise Him even in the bad times. Which is hard to do sometimes, amen? Yeah. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receives. He's talking about pain and punishment. Pain and punishment that comes from the love of God. The church doesn't want to teach that. They want to teach you, and I'm not talking about the entire church, I'm just talking about what I'm, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing come alive that only means death. It's like the serpent in the tree. You know, at one time the garden didn't have a serpent, and then it slithered its way in, and I see these 
See these ideas slithering in the way of the church. Repentance. Does anybody even know what repentance is anymore? You ask people the definition of repentance and they're like, oh, it's giving up things. The best definition I give you of repentance is that repentance is the sign that the Holy Spirit is with you. Because you could not repent without the power of God. Without the power of God, I can't love. Without the power of God, I can't forgive, I can't repent, I can't have mercy, I can't give mercy, I can't give grace. There is nothing good that comes from this world, the world of deception. Anything good that I have, I get from God. I can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. You can't have repentance without the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians Chapter 7, verse 10, it says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. We're talking about the sorrow that's sometimes associated with the love of God. Because God loves us, He convicts us. Because God loves us, He forgives us. But yet there's sorrow involved in all of it. And there better be. If you're not sorry for your sins, you won't quit your sins. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but look what else it says. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. We have a world of deception and a world of creation, and there is a separation, and it was separated by the uh, virgin birth, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't be fooled. We maintain a free will even after we're saved, and that's why we continue to sin, but yet, with the Holy Spirit, we regret that sin. And there's nothing wrong with regretting, but the world wants to tell you, why add more sorrow to your life? Just forget about it. It's a deadly deception. The disciples said to Jesus, said, would you show us the Heavenly Father? And what did he say? Come on, I know some of y'all are telling me. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. How do we see Jesus Christ today? Right here. I want you to think about this that I'm about to tell you. Let the Holy Spirit guide you because I don't think I'm, I'm smart enough to explain it the way God explained it to me this morning as I was going over this. And I thought it was so important to add to this message. You ever have something you wanted to say but you don't want to say it? Well, I pray the Holy Spirit right now will reveal it to you. When Moses went on the mountain and he looked at the, fire, the burning bush, the only impression that he got was the impression of the word that God was giving him through the bush. The word that Gideon got from the angel, the word that Mary got from the angel, were the only, was the only thing that mattered at that point in time. And that's the way Mary knew that she was found worthy enough by the Word of God. That Gideon was strong enough to be a leader by the Word of God. That Moses got instructions to do what he was supposed to do by the Word of God. Was it the angel? No. Was it the fiery bush? No. It was the Word of God. In Job chapter 42, let me, let me go over here real quick to Job. Everyone's life that ever heard the word of God walked away as they did in John 6.66 6, 6, or they were transformed. Either way, Gideon was transformed into a leader, Moses was transformed into a, a leader to deliver, uh, Mary was transformed into uh, the, the mother of Christ. All these things happened because of the word of God, not because of a bush, not because of an angel. Job said, after, after all of the accusations by his friends and after all the rebuttals and after everything that was done, God finally steps in and says, Job, you're saying a lot. And I understand why you're saying it. You're not saying anything that's untrue because you don't deserve what you're getting. But there's a reason why things are happening. But you've been boastful, Job. So I want to ask you a question. Were you there when I created this? Were you there when I created that? Were you there when I created this? And were you there when I created that? And after he said, uh, have you done all the things that, I, that I've done? Job says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. I've heard your word, God, but now my eyes seeth thee. If you're not seeing God when you read the Bible, something's wrong. And you need to, you need to get down on your knees and you need to ask Jesus, uh, for the Holy Spirit to guide you through His Word. Because the Word of God expressly shows us who God is. The Ten Commandments that is written in this Word tells us the character of God. 
Tell me that you don't know what Jesus is like without when, when you read this Word of God and you're willing to accept it. And that's a big part of it. It's about will, being willing to accept the Word of God. If you're not seeing God, it's because you're not paying close enough attention to the Word of God. Zacchaeus heard the preaching of Jesus and come down. He was so impressed, he said, I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor, and if I've taken it deceitfully, I'll give a fourth of it back. It wasn't the bush, it wasn't the angel, it was the Word that transformed these people's lives and can transport, uh, transform our lives. Um, Christians are always kind of afraid. I thought about this and thought, well, you know, if I was walking into a house and there was two or three big guys in there, you know, I'd, I'd be a little, little intimidated knowing that when I walked in there I was going to have to be in a fight. But I got to go. It would be worse for me if I had somebody that was shorter, more timid, more scared, and more weak than, my, than I was. Because then I'd know that not only do I have to fight them, but I got to protect them at the same time. Which leaves me vulnerable. But now if I have somebody that's a lot taller than me, a lot stronger than me, and can fight like Bruce Lee, I'm going to go in with confidence. Because not only do I know I don't have to uh, protect them, but they might protect me at the same time. <coughs> Too often got people, uh, Christians, forget who God really is. Too often they, they forget about the love of God that can deliver them from anxiety, depression, and fear. Mm -hmm. Think about this. If you got a child, and that child was in some trouble, and you knew about it, what would you do to help your child? You know, oftentimes I think that the Holy Spirit, when I think of something, it's really the Holy Spirit. And he's using my voice to say, hey, because it's hard for us to ask ourselves questions, and if we do, we think we're crazy. But oftentimes, I believe God asks us questions, and He does it in our own voice. And I thought, you know, I was in this little pickle, uh, uh, you want to call it, or my mom would call it, and uh, I was I was intimidated. I was just I was just plain scared, and I didn't know what to do. And uh, I heard this voice say, "Well, what would you do if your son or your daughter, your child?" was in this position and you had the power to fix it. I thought to myself, I'd fix it. I'd make it right. And then the voice said, doesn't your Heavenly Father love you more than that? Hmm. When you truly know the love of God, fear goes away. Because you know that if there's anything you could do to help somebody because of love, that God has the power and loves you much more. And God never lies. The truth of God's word and the love of God is the only thing that's gotten me through my life at times. As good as we think we are, we're not that good. You know, we represent the word of God as Christians. How do, how do people see God in you? Are they, are they seeing a lie? Are they seeing fear, worry, and doubt? Or are they seeing the truth? I'm not saying that we're always going to be perfect. You know, Jesus said when you fast, Disguise it. Oftentimes we need to disguise our fear so that we can show people that even in them times that we can we can trust in God. We're human, we're gonna have some fear. But we also know that God is real. Matthew 12, 44. Y'all know this. It's about the man who was demon possessed and then he was cleansed. And then uh, the demon went around trying to find a place to go, and he couldn't find a place to go, so he went back to the man, and he found the man. And then he went and got seven more demons worse than him and went in. But what does it say? What's the key word here? Jesus said, Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he was come, he find it empty, swept, and garnished. The key word there is empty. Make sure that you're always filled with the Holy Spirit. Because I can promise you there's not a demon anywhere. All the demons in the world of Satan himself can't, can't stand up to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as long as you have the Holy Spirit in you, you won't have to worry about the spirits of fear, worry, doubt, depression, anxiety. You know, the world tells us <coughs> that God's Word is not real. God's Word is confusing. God's Word is a metaphor. You can't be taken seriously. You know, you could use it as, as, as a good saying, and that's about as far as it'll go. And a lot of Christians are starting to believe this. There are Christians that can believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, but they can't believe that Jonah was resurrected out of a, a whale. You know, 
Too often we forget that there is a time when God takes over when we can't. You know, every time I think of something that's impossible, when I hear a story in the Bible that's impossible, the reason why I think it's impossible is because I've only went as far as man can go. Sure, Jonah could have done everything he did on his own up until the time when he was swallowed by a whale, but there's no way that man could do anything after that. But you're leaving out God and God's ability. Yeah, Moses could have, could have took all them people all the way up to the Red Sea. That's possible for Moses to do, but that parting of the Red Sea, that's impossible. That's because you stop where God starts. Let me tell you something. Too often Christians are stopping at a point in their life where God is starting. The problem is we don't have faith and trust in God, so the starting of God stops. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen? Amen. Would we reward our children for being bad? If our kid came in and started cursing, would we give them some candy? No. We reward our children because they please us. Because we know that they've learned from us and are doing well. <coughs> We need to stop in our lives when we're going through a tragedy or we're going through a hard time and remember that when we can't go any further, that's when God does step in and that's when we need it. Look, when we're, when we're happy and delighted, we're close to God. When we're in a tragedy, God's closer to us. And that's when God starts. And that's the problem with the world. They don't see where God starts. There's always a point, is there not? Look at every story in the Bible. Every story in the Bible starts out with God uh, calling or directing. And then it goes into the man or the woman doing. And then there's a point where God has to take over. And they just don't believe that God can take over. And they try to, they, they try to say that, um, that the word of God is not right in this way or that way. And I want to go back. I'm going to close with this, but I want to go back to this really quick. <clears throat> the two verses. Women, you better be submissive to your husbands. And you better know, you better realize that you were made for man and man wasn't made for you. Boy, you, you give that to a feminist and you have a fight on your hands. And a lot of them believe that God is patriarchal and that the Bible is patriarchal and that um, it is is painting women as less than uh, human or that they're sub be submissive slaves. Um, but does anybody know the meaning of the word submissive? Let me give it to you like this. If I get hungry, my stomach is going to tell my mind, who's now submissive to my stomach, that I need something to eat, find something to eat. My nose and my ears and my, and my eyes and, and, and my taste buds are going to be, uh, all my senses are going to be submissive to my mind to find whatever it is that I need. And then once they find it, once they locate it, my, my arms and my legs and my hands have to be submissive to my senses to go get it and retrieve it. Once it's retrieved, my mouth has to be submissive to my hand. It says open up and take. While I'm chewing, my throat has to be submissive to my mouth who says I'm getting ready to so I give it to you. I want you to swallow it and take it to the stomach. See, the stomach was the boss at the beginning. And everyone's submissive to the boss, and each one was submissive to one another to be submissive to the stomach. But now that the stomach has what it wants, it becomes submissive to all the other parts of the body that are saying, now, you digest that and give us our nutrition. If there's one point in the body that says no, if the hand said, I will not grasp it, if the throat tells the mouth, I will not swallow, then what it's doing is it's killing the rest of the body. Jesus tells us to be submissive to one another. Amen? As a church, we're being submissive. But what's the problem with Christians today? I'll be submissive when it's this particular person and not that one. And it's this particular time and not that one. When it's this particular church, but not this church. When we tell each other that one is more important than the other, or, or we don't have... Uh, uh, time to do this or time to do that, we wind up hurting ourselves. Submissiveness, the way the world looks at it, is not the way God meant it. Amen. And God means things in the right way. We get so caught up with political correctness and social justice that we don't see the truth in God's Word. Why? Because that is based on the world of deceit, not the world of creation. The world of creation says this. Submissiveness means... Will you surrender what you have to be used? 
You see, man was made lesser than the angels. Okay? Why? Because God created angels with eternal life. God created Lucifer, who had all these wonderful things. And what did he do with them? He attacked God. God didn't want to be attacked no more. But he, he was desperately wanting to make us in his image. So he made us in his image. But he made us lesser. That's why we had the tree of life. So that we had to depend on God for eternal life. Amen? And we have to depend on God for everything. So we didn't have the power, the full power that the angels had. And he puts Adam in the garden, and, and you know, a lot of people think that Adam's job was to just sit there and, and cool out in a pond or lay up in some leaves and the birds would bring him food. No, God said, you'll tend the garden. God said, you're going to work. Everyone that God ever called was working at the time they were called. God worked six days, rested one. Jesus was crucified for six hours, and in death he rested an hour on the cross. There's a parallel there. Adam was supposed to work the garden. But there was a point when he was supposed to do something to complete the will of God, and God said he's not able to do it. Why wasn't he able to do it? Because he didn't have everything that he needed. Why would God make him that way? Well, I told you the purpose why God made him that way. So God calls all the animals together, and all the animals, I've preached on this before, all the animals come up, Adam names all the animals, and every animal that went by, God said, you're not good enough, you can't be used, you can't be used, you can't be used. Why? Because animals are instinctual. Remember, we talked about that before. They're, they're based everything on sense of smell, and time of season, and, and, and the weather. You don't see bears pretending to be dolphins in a play out here, okay? You don't see rabbits pretending to be squirrels. Everything's instinctual. We get poetry. We have song. We have, people say, well, birds sing. Birds sing for a purpose. It's instinctual. We are made with them things that God has given us that no other animal has. And Adam didn't have that particular thing. So he made woman. A lot of people say, well, he made woman from man, so you know how that goes. He made man from dirt and woman from bone, but he made them both for a purpose, and both of them were made in the image of God, both man and woman. Now, I can't imagine taking any part of God from here and any part of God from here and one being greater than the other. I just can't imagine that. And as I said before, that's why when God and Jesus said, when you get married, you bring them parts back together again, you become one flesh. And you remember, y'all remember when I talked about the, this and how women were in Proverbs 7? Wisdom is described as a woman. So we got brawn without knowledge. A lot of guys will say, I, don't, I, I know a lot of women that don't have wisdom. And I'll say, yeah, well, I know a lot of men that aren't as strong as they used to be and women aren't as smart as they used to be. Why? Because we're not the same as we were when we were first created before sin. Sorry, we've liquidated a DNA. But people want to want to twist the word of God around. And they want to say, no, that, that means something else. It don't mean anything else. Woman was made for man because man couldn't do it on his own. Women, God is asking you. He's not commanding you. Be submissive unto your husbands. Okay? Under your own husbands. That is both in, in the fornication language and, and the, the submissiveness is a wife. But he also tells man to be submissive to his wife. But he tells him to do it out of love. A love that means that he is willing to put his wife before himself. That he's willing to do whatever it takes to keep her safe. And he's willing to die for her. Women aren't second-hand citizens. No matter what the world tells you. They're not, they're not lower than men, no matter what the world tells you. Our very foundation of belief is on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he and turned that to women, not men. Go tell the brethren. Ladies, go tell the brethren. You know, here's the thing. A lot of people say, well, women, women weren't really made as wisdom. Well, then tell me this. Why did Satan, the serpent, go to the woman instead of the man? And why was the temptation about wisdom? Was it not? And Adam was standing right there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that she had to go off and find him. It says she turned and gave him the fruit. He was standing there listening to the conversation. And he was saying, if you want to be really wise, eat the fruit. He said, no, 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 no. I'm wise enough to know what God said. God said if we eat it, we'll die. Oh, you won't die. That's the deceitfulness of the world. You won't die. Don't worry about that. The drug telling the person, oh, you won't die. Don't worry about it. Keep on going. You can stop anytime you want. And she looked at it and says, good, good to the eye, good for food, but it'll make me wise as God. So she bit into it. Then she turned to Adam, and he just took it. 
Why did he take it? Because he knows that wisdom is speaking. Well, she knows more than I do. You know, I got the, I got the character traits of God. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a warrior. I'm a conqueror. You know, it took that type of thing to, to conquer the elements, amen, to create all things, to do all things. Not that he was stupid, but there was just a limitation there that had to be there. And he was listening to this conversation about wisdom from the woman that was created to be his wisdom. And he thought, oh, well, she says it's okay. It's okay with me. She's got to be right. But then what did he tell God? It was the woman you made me. I didn't know no better. She conned me into it. Now, I'm, I'm adding more into that. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But what I'm trying to say is you can't go to God unless it's through Christ. You can't have repentance without the Holy Spirit. It's a sign that the Holy Spirit's there. And that grief that you receive when you sin means that you've been forgiven, you've been cleansed, and now you're being attacked again. But you don't like it now because you're a different person. I've had people come up to me and say, how do I know I'm saved? Well, how do you feel when you sin? That's, that's it. Well, I'm grieved about it. it I'm, I'm grieved about, about wondering whether I'm saved. Just because you're grieved in the Holy Spirit who's already sealed you. That's how you know you're saved. The Word will set you free. The Word, word will make you clean. The Word will give you power. But the world is trying to take it from you. They truly are. And they're trying to get rid of it. You know, we serve a risen Savior, amen? amen. Just a little while ago, we, we celebrated Easter. They tried to kill a messenger, and they couldn't do it. So now they're trying to kill the message. Don't let them kill it in your heart. Don't let them have it away. Women, you are wise. Men, you are strong. We do need, need one another. Amen. We really do. And the church is the bride of Christ. We should be wiser than that. Amen? amen. Let me close with this. And I, you said, well, you said close a little while ago. Well, I'm going back to my first days. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much, right? Well, what does that mean? It means simply this. That Abraham believed God, and that was counted unto him for righteousness. Amen? And you'll see it everywhere else in the Bible. All God is saying is, look, when you ask me, and you believe that I can, and that I will, if it's my will and it's good for you, then your prayer is going to accomplish a lot of things. It might not accomplish exactly what you want, but it's going to accomplish a lot of things, and it's going to give you the desires of your heart, truly the true desires of your heart. It's going to work out for the best. And I know that I can count on the Word of God no matter what. Don't let the, don't, don't let the Word be changed in your heart. Don't let anyone change what you know to be true about the Word of God. Father God, we thank you for this time. It is truly a great privilege, God, to be here today, to, to preach your word, God. I pray I haven't failed you. I pray that something new has been taken on and looked in a different way and absorbed in another way and, and a perception has been, been sharpened, God. And I pray, God, that uh, I could say thank you to you, God, for the, for the blessings that you've given me in this word, these little things and these little tidbits and, and the way things are God looked at it. I, I just thank you. I, I, I'm not wise without you. I'm not loving without you. I'm not caring without you. I'm nothing without you. And I, I praise and thank you for that knowledge and that wisdom. And ask your blessing upon me, my ministry, God, for your glory, my benefit, and the benefit of others. And that we, with our ministry, whatever it is, leave here today and show the world who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Some 300.